All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats, covering all aspects of their story, from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today's guest is Nick the Machine Larvery. Chief Warrant Officer 2 Nick Larvery was born and raised in Massachusetts and is an active duty member of the United States Army Special Forces. Commonly known as the Green Berets, the Special Forces perform critical missions including direct action, counterinsurgency, foreign internal defence, special reconnaissance and unconventional warfare. And in 2013, while deployed to Afghanistan, he and his detachment fell victim to an insider attack, ultimately resulting in the loss of his leg. Following a year of surgeries and initial recovery, including the use of the prosthetic leg at Walter Reed National Medical Military Center, he returned to his unit. Refusing a military medical retirement, Nick set his sights on returning to operational status. And in 2015, at the conclusion of a challenging comprehensive assessment designed to evaluate Nick's abilities to operate, he returned to his detachment and was subsequently deployed once again to Afghanistan, conducting full-spectrum combat operations. Nick is considered the first Special Forces operator to return to combat and is above the knee amputee. Nick is currently serving as a Special Forces Warrant Officer and is widely recognised as an experienced subject matter expert in special operations, intelligent fusion, mission planning and complex problem solving across all operational continuums. He's also the first amputee in military history to complete the Special Forces Warrant Officer Technical and Tactical Certification Course, the Special Operations Combatives Program Instructor Course and the Special Forces Combat Diver Qualification Course. Nick's awards include the Silver Star, three Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, Bronze Star with V for Valor, Defence Meritorious Service Medal, two Meritorious Service Medals, Joint Service Commendation Medal, Joint Service Achievement Medal, two Army Commendation Medals, Army Achievement Medal, the OSS Society Peter Ortiz Award, the Bruce Price Leadership Award, and the Special Operations Command Excalibur Award. Nick is a warrior, a leader, a speaker, an author, but most importantly, a husband and father of two young boys. And now, let's get to the interview. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to feature somebody who I follow on social media. You know, you're so motivational and inspiring. But for those who maybe don't recognize the name, could you give a quick introduction? Yeah, man, I appreciate it as well, Ian. Thanks for the time. Um, Yeah, the 32nd intro, uh, my name is Nick Lavery. I'm currently an active duty member of the United States Army Special Forces, more commonly referred to as the Green Berets. I've been doing this now about 15 and a half years. Uh, originally for Boston Mass, spoiler alert, uh, first and foremost and most significantly, I'm a husband and my wife and I are proud parents of two young boys Oldest is five, youngest is 21 months. Um, and aside from that, man, um, you know, I'm I'm slowly venturing into kind of my my next purpose in life beyond my service in the uniform, which are things that I literally I'm doing one of those things right now. Uh, and just the the entire concept of of doing some of this stuff is still a bit foreign to me, but you know, I'm, I'm now officially and technically a writer, something I learned I really enjoy doing. My first book came out this year. It's titled Objective Secure. And that's something that I'll continue into the future, um, which is, you know, awkward a bit, unusual, still surprising to myself, but also really excited. 
Well, you've said in a video that you've released that you had like a mission and a passion to join the, you know, the the military and then to go into the special forces. What gave you this kind of sense of protection of others? Did you always have it as a kid or was it instilled later on? This is an awesome question, uh, Ian. Thank you for asking me this uh, early on. I wasn't expecting this. And I could spend an hour talking about this alone. <laughs> I'll do the short version for the sake of time. My protective instincts is something that was developed over time during my upbringing, my time as a youth. And it was learned really painfully and through a lot of struggle and hardships. And that came as the result of me moving, my family and I, we moved every year for the first half of my life, all the way up until I was in college, really. So I was the new kid in school every year as a young person. And because of that, I really struggled socially. I struggled to gain friends and keep friends. And I got picked on, you know, I got bullied, which back then really wasn't looked at so seriously as it is today. It was just kind of how to be a kid. So Mm -hmm. I struggled, I struggled socially. And whenever I did get a friend, it became the, the most important thing I had in my life. And I was willing to do anything to protect that. And Doing that in repetition really created this protective instinct I had for those that I cared for. Um, And then, you know, I can retrospectively look at that now, but that's not something I could appreciate at the time growing up as a, as a, as a child, but looking back at, at what has made me successful in the military and as a green beret, I would attribute a lot of that to that nature nurture aspect of the way I was, I was raised and what I experienced as I grew up. But, you know, that's not why I decided to join the military, man. I decided to join the military for one very simple reason. And that was nine 11. I was a sophomore in college. Nine 11 happened. It was an incredibly impactful moment for me and most of us that were old enough to recognize what was happening. And I was really pissed off and I wanted to be part of the response to that. I mean, and do you think that was part of the, when the situation, when you, you know, you had the injury to your leg, was it that protection you felt, that nurturing of like somebody who's a, maybe a new, a newbie to, of the, to the military and, you know, did you feel like a duty to protect them or did it happen in that split second and that was just your training and that was just your natural protection taking over, do you think? Yeah, man. Um, I would attribute my response to the events that were unfolding around me on the day that I was wounded to be a result of my protective instincts nature, which is actually opposite, um, or at least it's different from what I really am expected to do in that scenario. Mm-hmm. And I've gone Many back and do relive this so many times. It's like, you know, as soldiers and as, as operators, we're expected to perform in scenarios that are wildly unnatural. And this just comes at the result of a whole lot of repetition and training. And that's what that does, like training and conditioning. It it conditions your mind and body to be able to do things regardless of how natural that may be for us as humans. Like running towards the sound of gunfire is an unnatural thing for a Mm. living organism to do. And that's what we're expected to do when we train to go do that. In that particular moment, I, I knew what my job actually was. And it was to move to something that could protect me from bullets and remove that problem. What superseded me doing that was, as we've been talking here the last couple of minutes, was was the love of a teammate and my protective instincts of someone I cared for. This isn't something that I'm I'm really proud of. And actually, I use this as a lesson oftentimes that demonstrates the importance of training and the reason why we train a certain way and have certain standard operating procedures to respond to certain instances. Those aren't entirely flawless. They are not perfect in nature. Uh, They are not absolute. But to answer your question, I decided to do what I did based off of an instinct and an emotion and and a calculated risk of what would potentially happen if I did this versus if I did what I'm really supposed to do. Because I mean, I, I sometimes think when I'm watching your like your social media and that, it's like 
it's almost like you don't understand just how different you are, like how unique you are to actually have stepped in front of somebody with a machine gun to protect somebody and then to have a leg amputated. And most people have been so soul crushed. You went, nah, I'm going back. I want to keep serving. This is my mission. This is my passion. So you're, you know, so you're the only person who's ever gone back with, with the, the level of amputation that you had. And you do these amazing things. You're inspiring so many people. And you you just seem to accept it as, eh, part of my life. You are really unique in that. Do you think that resilience, that kind of, you know, when they kept saying you needed more surgeries, you just got up and went, yeah, okay. Like, was it the work ethic you got from your parents? Was it that you knew this, you had this old bigger mission rather than the injury didn't overwhelm as such? Ian, man, you're, you're just on fire. There's so much there to unpack. Um, you know, for one, yes, I am unique in the sense that I'm the only person that has completed certain tasks and I've um, managed to complete some accomplishments under my condition as a one-legged guy that no one else has done before. So I recognize the uniqueness of that and of me. But to your point, I think I'm I'm very deliberate about messaging that this that I'm not special in nature that I possess some sort of skill or talent or capacity that is what enabled me to do these things that other people don't have like the, these were really nothing more than a whole series of really difficult choices that I just made in repetition day after day after day so yes it's I am unique so to say, but um, there's no magic. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no magic within me that allowed it to happen. These are these are options that we all have, and that's one of my missions is to is to loudly and aggressively scream that from the mountaintops. Is when you see the things that I've done, don't be starstruck and don't be amazed. Um, you can certainly be appreciative, and I'm humbled and honored by that. But look at look at some of the things that I've done and just recognize that I'm a regular human being. And whatever it is that your mission is or whatever adversity that you're dealing with, you can perhaps leverage some of the principles and philosophies and tools that I did to be able to be successful in your own life. That's that's what's most important. And then to answer kind of your follow on in terms of resilience and, you know, how, how did I keep going and just kind of brush things off? I'll tell you the there were there were countless times in of frustration and failure and doubt and fear and setbacks and all that. I mean, it was a roller coaster ride, and there were plenty of times that I began to doubt myself and second guess what I had set my sights on. What was key, because I, I think that this is inevitable for anybody. It is it's going to happen, particularly when you're when you set your sights on something quite large or quite unlikely. Mm -hmm. What was critical for me was being able to quickly get back up and or refocus my mindset onto why I was doing what I was doing and having such a connection with who I am and my purpose in life. That is what I continuously just grasp onto in those moments of weakness and pain and struggle and discomfort Yes, this sucks right now, but there's a reason why you're going through this. And that reason is something bigger than this temporary moment of discomfort. Learn from it, get back up and keep going. And then just do that again and again and again. And you will find a way to get to where you're trying to go. Could you think that's what a lot of people struggle with? It's that moment where we initially go, oh, you know, that's it. It's over. Like we, you know, we get lost in the weeds. We, we rarely have an, a sense of what we want as men. So we struggle to have a mission. We struggle to have a, a plan of attack that and most of us are just battering about day to day. We don't have like, you know, you have set missions and parameters to follow that most of us don't know what we want in life. So any bump kind of just knocks us for six. I, yeah, I'll, I'll just focus on two things here. One, I think you're spot on. I think most lack a vision of the best version of themselves. They lack a vision of who they want to be, what they want to do. They lack 
a mission. They lack a clarity of a mission, um, which is why within my book and within a lot of stuff that I talk about as I'm consulting or speaking or engaging with people, it's like, what is the mission? What, what, without identifying that, it's going to be really difficult to find yourself in a place of happiness and success for one, but then also have that to grab onto when things start to get really hot. So if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So having mm-hmm. that set, that direction and that vision, in my opinion, is absolutely critical. So there's that. And then also, yes, I mean, scientifically and according to the laws of biology and neurology and psychology and physiology, we as humans, our brain does a lot of things for us, a lot of things for us, but it's number one responsibility and its highest priority is our survival. It wants to keep us alive. And therefore we have these indicators that the brain signals us with in order to ensure, or at least increase the likelihood of our survival. We know these indicators as pain, fear, general discomfort. This is when our brain's saying like, whoa, 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 like let's not do that because it's dangerous. So there's a risk. Mm. I want to live as long as possible. I want to keep this organism going as long as possible. That's my number one priority here. Let's not um, jump off of the roof of this building. Or, you know, let's not go for that extra rep on the squat. Because if you fail, there's a chance of physical injury. But more than likely, there's a chance of emotional damage because it hurts our pride, our ego, we're embarrassed. That has a very direct correlation to our actual health and wellness. So we have these alerts that's built in with us as human beings. So this is this is by definition normal. This is supposed to happen. Therefore, when we hit these moments of struggle, our brain is going to oftentimes be our greatest adversary because it's going to give us all these very convincing reasons, justifications, excuses as to why we should stay down or just pick a new direction, right? Like this isn't the best time or, you know what? I haven't quite learned enough yet. Maybe I just need to pause and I, you know, I I don't know, or they all start to sound really, really convincing, but this again is built within us on purpose. The brain wants us to stay in this comfort zone space like medically it's referred as homeostasis where everything is very predictable and very repeatable and in line with longevity and survival the challenge and this is what makes life so difficult is if we accept that to be true we also then have to realize that there are going to be times when we have to ignore what our brain is telling us and instead listen to our heart and our soul and be willing to take that risk. And we hit these crossroads in countless times every single day. And although this is quite simple, it's anything but easy. This is really difficult. But I do think that when we're deliberate about when we take that risk and we're very operational about how we do it and analytical, our risk calculus process begins to speed up and get more efficient and more accurate to equip us to not only make those decisions faster in real time, but also assume more risk where we can listen to our heart and soul without being reckless. So was there like a mantra or something like, because, you know, like when you were at your lowest, maybe feeling resentful to, you know, the soldier that you helped or, you you know, fed up and then so and, you know, maybe suffering from PTSD or any of these sort of things. What what was it that made you snap in and start listening to your heart and soul and think, I need to come back? Especially like when your parents and friends were maybe saying, Should you go back? You know, you've should you leave? You know, especially when you have that level of initial re- resistance from family who look out for you, but they're giving you that kind of feedback saying, No, no, we want you safe and well. How how do you sort of switch off that? Because you like you were saying earlier about running towards gunfire. Because that can be taught to a certain level. But do you mm-hmm. think special forces soldiers are born with this or can it be taught? You know, is there a mantra you would use to anybody listening that could learn to do that to a certain level? Yeah, um, a lot of great stuff here too as well. I'll start off with kind of where you ended. Uh, do I think that good 
special forces operators are born. No, I would say that that they are created, and it's it's predominantly based on skill, um, coupled with character traits, personality traits, etc. Talent exists, right? But my my more in depth analysis and, and acquisition of knowledge into the difference between talent and skill is really that you know talent being born with something. It's really not being born with with the c- capability to do something really well automatically from the second you you've been created. Talent is actually, according to a lot of data and case studies, is a more increased capacity to learn something really fast. But so meaning like you look at Michael Jordan, you could say that dude was born to be a basketball player and which is probably Mm -hmm. true, but that doesn't mean that when he was in the womb and when he was two years old, he automatically knew how to hit free throws flawlessly. His talent was that he had a much higher capacity to learn how to shoot free throws much faster than average people. So talent Mm. versus skill, I would say exists across all sectors and and walks of life. So either those that are born with a higher degree of talent to be a soldier or a special forces operator. Yeah, probably. But I do think it's it's wildly, largely, almost always skill-based and that you can create that within someone that's got the more so the mentality to go about the difficulties to become um, you know, an operator or, or a green beret. Um, and in terms of like mantras and whatnot, or, you know, you asked about family members and, and they're questioning what it was I was trying to do and having second thoughts, trying to be supportive because they love me and care for me and want to be in my corner, but also want us to be grounded in reality and pragmatism. Um, the way I went about doing that was I was just able to recognize pretty early on why these people that care for me or people that that don't know me well were second guessing what I was doing. And for one, I knew that what I was trying to do had never been done before. So like with anything where there's no precedence, people are like, is that even possible? That's a, and that's a hmm. fair question. But more significantly than that, I knew that that was coming from a place of love and they were somewhat blinded, or at least they had blinders on, where all they could focus on was my well-being as a son, as a brother, as a teammate. Like that's where this second guessing was would be, would be coming from. They didn't want to see me get hurt, not only in the terms of me going back to being in combat hurt, but also failing, and then what that effect would have on me. Would that send me down this really nasty, dark, depressive road? Because I set my sights on something so unrealistic and I was so obsessed with it that if I failed, what would that do to my overall wellness? So I was able to grasp onto their reasoning pretty early on. Therefore, one, I didn't hold any resentment towards them, but I knew that I was going to be the only one on the planet that had the level of clarity in my vision that I did. It was mine and I could explain it and communicate it to as many people as possible, as thoroughly as possible, but it's mine to own. This is yours. And one of the costs of ambition is being misunderstood. And that that's just part of that process. You have to have a willingness to accept criticism and feedback from those that you respect, but also own the fact that this is your life and your mission. And the only limitations really are the ones that we place on ourselves. So I was able to maintain relationships with those that I cared about and take in their advice, but also concurrently know that, hey, this is this is what I'm doing. I am completely committed to this thing. Regardless, thank you. I love you. Uh, But I'm going to I got things I got to do. I'm going to keep going. Because it is a difficult thing to mean, you know, they mean well, but you have to sort of say, yes, but I'm looking at this without the emotion. You know they're there to protect you, and sometimes it can override, like you're saying, their you know their understanding of what you want in life. And if you have a strong enough mission, you can override this. I mean, I always find I can't remember who said it was. You fall back to the highest point of your training, not to the level that the, the situation demands. So you know, if you're not trained super well for enough for it, 
you're in a shit storm basically what do you what are you taught in the military because you're an expert in sort of irregular activities about you know the analysis planning things etc how how are you taught this and do you think that helps you see things from a sort of non-emotional point of view you're using data to kind of see where people are going wrong and that's what's making you such a good author making you a good motivational speaker etc I give a lot of my credit to my time in the military, probably most of it, um, because especially the special operations community, uh, you and 10 of your teammates are going to be dropped off anywhere in the world with the expectation to solve really complex problems with very minimal support, almost Mm -hmm. put into a position where it's, it, it outreaches your headlights. You have you have to be able to perform and and execute at a degree beyond what most would be capable of doing, and that's part of what makes special operations unique and and special is to be able to do that. Um, so just that that level of complex problem solving and the methodologies that we are taught and then leverage and use on how to dissect problems and then begin putting together solutions objectively. And then I would just add that while we live in the realm of the human dynamic, particularly as Green Berets, like for your audience that doesn't know the difference between say Green Berets and Navy SEALs or Army Rangers or any of our special operations units, you, you really don't send a Green Beret team, otherwise known as an ODA, someplace to do something by themselves. We go places to do stuff with and through local personnel, so indigenous population people. That's that's what we do. So we have to be familiar with the human dynamic and how that works and the ability to influence people and, and lead foreigners on a particular task that they may have absolutely no idea how to do. So the combination of having these very objective, science-based approaches and methodologies to solve problems coupled with the fact that we have to do that with human beings that have all of the emotional baggage and variables and issues that all human beings have to ram those things together to then solve a problem. And having done that for several deployments and a whole ton of training prior to me being wounded, I was able to leverage those aspects of what we do professionally and then apply them to my personal mission of getting back to my lifestyle. So, I mean, is there a certain sort of skill set of like soft and hard skills that you think the, you know, that you are taught in the military that works so well, you know, your ability to like, you know, speak to people uh, on a, on like a layman's terms to get them, you know, to build relationships, to build a cohesive faction between you and the people you're working with, you know, how you deal with fear, how you can lead. Is there a skill, like, is there certain skills that you think that you've noticed that all the top performers, all the special force members have an abundance or it does it depend on your unique role within that team? If I just look at the Army Special Forces specifically, which is where I've spent my career, it is absolutely a combination of, we'll say, the hard and the soft skills. And Mm. we'll say hard skills being the more aggressive stuff, the shooting, the jumping out of planes, the running fast, blowing things up, lifting weights, like all of that stuff, which is what draw most of us to want to go do this line of work, right? Like I want to jump out of planes, blow things up, kick down doors and shoot bad guys in the face. There is an entire host, however, of some of these softer skills that are absolutely essential to make any of the cool guy stuff possible. Mm -hmm. And most of us type A warrior types uh, are really disinterested in, in some of those other aspects, but they're essential. They're absolutely essential. And, This was a huge part of my recovery and actually my return back to the team because fortunately I was able to recognize, which was a difficult pill to swallow, me growing up as an athlete, a college athlete, a jiu-jitsu, MMA, 
I was, my physicality was what I brought to the team. And that was who I was. I was a physical dominant specimen. And that's what my team asked of me. And that's what I enjoyed doing. So everybody won. In the hospital, now leg gone, I was able to digest the reality that no matter how much time I spent in the weight room, on the track, I would never be as physically dominant as I was with two legs, which again was hot to accept. But once I did, it was like, okay, let's, let's take that as reality. What can I do to, to make up the difference with what I'm going to lose physically in order to maintain myself as an overall asset? So if I'm going to lose X in the physical realm, how can I make up that same difference, if not excel past it, with otherwise? And I began looking at a lot of these softer skills of our business, and I committed myself to it. And as, as much as I disliked doing these things and studying these things and going through these types of schools and courses, I just believed that it would increase my overall value so I could be that asset that I had to be if and when I got back to the team. And just to kind of go full circle, once I did make it back and I was back in Afghanistan, back in combat on the team, I was able to employ a lot of those different skill sets, uh, which really just validated my faith that I had, you know, a year or two prior. But I was operating, and I'll just hammer on that, that one word. I was operating on blind faith for a good portion of the time. And, you know, the definition of that or a definition being a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Like I didn't know that anything that I was doing or my strategy would work, but I just believed in my heart and my soul that it was possible. It made sense on paper and then through pure discipline and execution is what enabled me to do it, which then again proved to be accurate. So would you treat failure as a sort of more as a learning experience, like you were saying that you were trying to find your new role in and readjust to, you know, your new mission parameter, so to speak. So you were using failure as a kind of way of like, we'll see if that works. Okay, I now need, I now set my goals to be this way. How do we, because you say mission first as a good way to sort of take it forward. How do you start explaining to somebody who's completely lost, but wants to do target X, how can they start using these kind of beliefs, this amazing way mindset you have to start improving their life, do you think? Well, for one, you mentioned failure. Um, yeah, I do believe under most circumstances, failure is our greatest learning tool. It, it is within the failure that the wisdom is located. And when we train and practice with, with that understanding and acceptance, that is the time to make the mistakes. That is the time to get it wrong. That is the time to fail in order to learn, to improve, so that when it's game time, and you know, for us, when we're actually in the gunfight, we've made enough mistakes prior and we've failed and we've messed it up enough times prior that we do pretty good when we need to do it. Hmm. What I think prohibits many of us from that sort of mentality is our pride. And it's our, and again, it's our ego. And that is, that again is inherently built within us on purpose because a shock to our pride, a shock to our ego that causes emotional damage, which is directly linked to overall wellness, which our brain does not want to have. So we're designed to avoid failure. That's, that's normal. That is what's supposed to happen. But again, the willingness to take the risk and extend into that realm is where the knowledge is located. And that is how we get better. If we can just set our ego and pride aside for a second and extend, mess up, and then look back to see what went wrong. And then how can I improve upon it? And then you do that again and again and again. Through that process alone, you are creating a very dangerous human being. You are creating a weapon that is capable of anything. If you take, if you take somebody who has committed to failing at repetition, authentic failure, right? and then the, there's a difference, but real, actual, I am going to go do this right now, and then you don't do it, you miss. You take someone who's willing to do that with repetition and not only get back up and keep going, but learn every time it happens, 
how do you stop someone who is willing to live that way? And the answer is you, you really, you can't. And it's just on us to be able to, to do that, accept it, take the pain, take the discomfort, because it has to hurt. If it doesn't hurt, you don't learn the lesson. The pain is the catalyst to learn. The pain is the catalyst for the wisdom. But you do that with repetition, you've become a, a very lethal asset. You've become a very dangerous tool. Um, and, you know, I, from someone who grew up playing competitive sports and as a young person, like I was that typical guy that never failed. Like I had this no fail mentality. I will always win. And not only is that inaccurate and somewhat immature, but living that way, you are placing a ceiling on what you're able to actually learn. So. Failure is an absolute critical component of the process. Again, we want to fail in training so that we can win in competition. It's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy, so how do you know which ones are worth your hard-earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. I love that. I love the way you look at it because how many people do you see nowadays who immediately go fail once? Nah, I'm not doing that. I'll get a guy in to do it. I'm not going to go away and learn it. I'm not going to try and figure it out. I'm not going to be like, you know, go and try it and see what works, what doesn't work, and then readjust your plan from it. How on earth do you, how do you start treating somebody to be proactive? Because hmm. when you deal with the regular activities on the battlefield, so, you know, you've got this great way of like planning, analysis, systems of building relationships. You you know what to expect because you're away without resources. So when the shit hits the fan, you can actually adapt to it in real time. How are you taught to learn from that? Do they go through certain like operational um, training exercises that gets you to think on your feet and they throw different things at you? Or how could we learn it like, you know, the the fat middle-aged guy who's in an office cubicle who can barely do anything if it's out with his routine, he panics. Is it a way that we can treat, start learning away from combat situations? Absolutely, man. And, you know, the combat environment in, in a lot of ways, and I'm certainly biased, is kind of a great reference because it's at the extreme of a lot of aspects of being a human, actual life and death an actual hysteria and chaos that's going on around you at all times. The highest of emotional spikes, adrenaline, cortisol, just the most extreme. But you can apply all of the exact same methodologies and principles and tools and ways we go about doing that to anything um, without question. So, you know, how, you know, how do you do it, man? And that's the, that's the, the never, it, it, that question doesn't get stale. It's kind of, and, and the, the, the answer, in my opinion, is um, there is no exact formula. So forget about trying to find the formula. I mean, in today's world, the access to information has never been as readily available ever in history as it is now. And if you go on the internet and start searching how to blank, you'll find 8 billion ways to go about doing it. And it's not to yep. say any of them are wrong. In fact, they all could be very right. Um, but the idea of finding the formula f is something I would recommend forget. Let's just focus on finding a formula or a system that works for you now. And then let's iterate and let's build on it slowly. Um, and this has been my point, you know, in the, in the physical fitness world, like like most worlds, there are very few ironclad facts because as we learn more, we disprove theories that were considered factual for years and years and years. There is one of several that is considered to be as ironclad of a fact as it gets. 
And that's the term progressive overload, which is just a fancy way of saying your goal, if, if you're trying to build strength or build muscle, is to just do a little bit more every time you train or a little bit more every time you hit that same muscle group or a little bit more every week. Small incremental increases. And that could be increase in the actual number of, of the weight on the bar. It could be an increase in the number of reps you do per set. It could be an increase in number of sets you do per exercise. There's a lot of different ways, metrics you can play around with. But the idea is just do a little bit more than you did last time, which again, isn't a revolutionary concept. You can apply this to anything. But if we apply progressive overload or just being iterative, that is what I typically recommend people out of the gate. The guy that's working the office cubicle nine to five who's lost is, okay, first off, as we've discussed, what are you trying to do here? Who are you trying to become? Because if you don't know what that is, then there's not much point in getting going at a thousand miles an hour if you're going in a completely opposite direction of where you actually want to go. So let's identify right. that. But once we have that, okay, now we just simply identify just a couple. It doesn't have to be this crazy complex algorithm. What are a couple things that will benefit you to move from where you are now to where you're trying to go? And if, in an objective secure, I go through a much more in-depth process with tools and how someone can take it to kind of the higher levels of planning and how you can operationalize your success. But at a very basic, simple level, what are you trying to do? These things are something that you think will help you get there. Okay. Start small, progressive overload, start small, right? If you're currently waking up at 6am or 7am and that's your normal routine and you're trying to become more disciplined you're trying to buy yourself some more time and energy to execute, you know, whatever task it is. Don't just automatically the next day set your alarm clock for 3.30 and go that route. Yeah, you may be able to do that for a day or two, but chances are that's just too big of a jump. It's going to be too much of a shock to your system for it to be sustainable. So rather than that, if you normally get up at 7, tomorrow, get up at 6.55. Okay, do that for three days. You're probably going to notice that you don't, there's no difference whatsoever in how you feel. Don't even worry about what you do with those five minutes. Just get up at 655, do that for a week. Okay, cool. How was that? Hey, Nick, that was actually really simple. I didn't even notice a difference throughout my entire day. Cool. Tomorrow, 650. Let's do that for three or four days. Day after that, 645. Let's jump to 630. Just this small, gradual, incremental adjustment within what we're currently doing now is typically recommended as do I as a preferred option. Because if you're currently able to deadlift 100 pounds and your dream is to be able to deadlift 800, if you go from 100 to six and thinking that that's going to happen, it's, it's not going to happen. It's, it's just too big of a jump. So give yourself some patience, and a powerful word, take the edge off yourself a little bit, Recognize that there's a difference between patience and procrastination, but patience is essential. Patience is nothing more than understanding and recognizing and accepting the fact that it's going to take some time, but it is going to take time when we are working at it proactively with consistency, likely every day or within every other day. So instill some patience, right? You've made it this far in life with waking up at seven. So like there's no rush to get to 330, but let's be proactive and just iteratively progressive overload, start working ourselves towards that point where you can be as efficient and as productive as possible six months from now, 12 months from now, whatever. Dom, I can see why you're helping so many people. Like you have this unique way of just taking it and like selling it with passion and I can see why so many people like, you know, it was like five star reviews all the way through the book. I downloaded it on my Audible account. You know, I was just like, this guy gets it. He really pushes people into it. And there's so many rabbit holes I'm trying to avoid going down because it's probably a couple hour podcast on each of these. Like, But how are you taught then like to go through it? Because like if say if I miss an alarm clock and it goes off at 7.15 instead of like 6.55, for example, not too much is going to happen. I maybe miss my bus and I have to get the second bus. In your situation, it might be that potentially something bad could happen. You miss a potential threat, et cetera. 
how are you taught to you know use like analysis of threats um to use like to, you know just to check that your plan's working and check in real time so it doesn't go off kilter and doesn't have potential injuries etc yeah so one phrase that comes to mind ian as soon as you say that is one that we use and that is no plan survives first contact and when I say contact, that means that we are now in contact with the enemy. We are now in an engagement. We're now in a gunfight. No plan survives first contact. Mike Tyson has a very similar uh, phrase where he says everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. And then the plan yep. kind of doesn't necessarily go out the window, but you need to adjust. Because in our world, in the boxing ring, in the life of us as human beings, there are countless variables that are completely and totally out of our control. And my only point here is you can then you could potentially argue in that case, well, then what's the point of planning at all if the second someone shoots at you, which is part of your job, the plan goes out the window? Why even bother planning? Well, there's several reasons, but one is that it's simply a known point for everyone to be able to get back to, to get back to moving forward. It's a known point to return it's a known rally point. It's a known point in time that if and when we can reconsolidate, we deal with the variables, the problems, okay, now we can get back onto our track and continue moving effectively as a unit until the next thing happens and then we have to adjust. There's another expression we have. I talked about SOPs or standard operating procedures that we have. There's an expression we have. SOPs are an 80% solution that work 80% of the time. And it just means that Yes, you have a recourse. You have something to fall to when something happens, but it's not going to account for everything. There is going to be variables, again, that we have to assess and analyze in real time and then modify whatever it is we were doing or are doing. So while strategy and structure and discipline and being regimented and having programs that are as efficient as possible that maximize our ROI on whatever it is we're doing are very powerful tools and ones that I communicate often and use often. There is also something to be said about having a certain degree of adaptability and flexibility built within us. That if this happens, I set my alarm for five I didn't hear it go off until 5.15. In that moment, you could just go, oh my God, like my whole day is ruined. My whole week is ruined. Like I'm totally effed. I might as well just completely fall off the wagon. And instead of eating my oatmeal and egg whites, I'm going to go crush some pancakes. Like I've already messed it up. So what difference does it make? I'll just, I'll get back on track on Monday, right? I mean, how often do we say that? How often do you hear that? It's like, whoa, hold on a second. We can make up for this 15 minutes. This is not the end of the world. What's key is, again, no plan survives first contact. We had a plan. The plan still exists. We're not exactly where we would have been within real time and space, but it's something we can get back to. It's something that we need to get back to. And being able to brush that off, take that loss, Again, you could look at this as a failure. Like I failed to get up on time. Okay, cool. Again, I love failure. Let's examine why. Did I not go to bed early enough? Did I actually set my alarm? Did I put it on PM instead of AM? Like what was the reason why I blew that 15 minutes? This is all opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. If we look at it that way, accept it for the fact that it is a mess up, which is okay and actually good. Let's learn from it. But more significantly, get back on track now. Forget Monday. Eat the egg whites. Eat the oatmeal. Get the workout in. You'll yeah. find a way where you can make up that difference or at least mitigate the damage. But don't just cash in all your chips and let the wheels fall off. That is, seems to happen, in my experience with those that I have the privilege of work with, amazingly often where one small error, like 15 minutes wake up, will just lead to this series of horrible decisions because they feel like, you know what? I already messed this up. What difference does it make? I might as well just let it come completely unglued 
and I'll figure it out later and get back on track later. It's like, whoa, right now you're at a moment in time when you can stop, you can detach for a second, realize that this is 15 minutes that can easily be made up. And this is just an example. This could be anything. You can make that up. What's critical is right now, in this moment, right now, you're at this crossroads where most are going to off-ramp and make things worse. You have a chance to not only learn from what just happened, but get back onto your track now. I love it. That is so motivating, like so inspiring and so helpful to a lot of people listening. I mean, for, you know, if somebody says, oh, I had a bad day, and you're like, did you really? Or was it a bad 15 minutes? You know, there's that belief where you can split mm. the day up into four block periods. So if you have a shitty first nine, like say seven to nine, you know that you've got 10 to 12 to that block to reset, restart and get yeah. recalibrate. And I love that kind of thinking. It's like, it's not the end of the day. If you have one mistake, learn from it and then look back and go, okay, that's how I'm going to fix it. I love that kind of approach. Now, for people who are thinking, I'm going to get your book, I'm fucking pumped up, I'm going to do this, this and this. How do you explain to them to start building, like, you know, because you've got your like your goals, you write up on your whiteboard, about 1% better. How do you get them to be self-honesty, you know, self, um, discipline in their life, to mm. actually get to a point where we can build the combat chassis in the gym, we can get the diet on point, we can start moving? But how do we start getting to a point where we're read, we're disciplined enough to really take the teachings from the book. Mm -hmm. you, you bring up another great point, Ian. Um, and there, there's a lot, there's a lot of examples and scenarios that you can use, but there's in these different training iterations that we run, we run a lot of the kind of complex tactical training scenarios. Um, many of which are based specifically on for leadership and for leaders. And there's one where, uh, and, and, and <laughs> We'll just say the student will mess this up 99 times out of 100, uh, but it's a phenomenal learning point. And we'll, as instructors or as leaders that are running these simulations, we'll, we'll create just absolute chaos, right? Absolute chaos all around mm -hmm. them, almost completely impossible to like fully like figure out what's happening and stop making rational decisions. This is done by design. And then we'll pause everything that's happening and grab this leader who's in charge and go, okay, this is what's happening over here. This is that blah, 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 blah. What do you need to know right now? What's your most important thing that you need to know right now? And again, 99.9 .9 out of 100 will just start talking about random. I need to know my assets. I need to know my resources. I need to know how big of an enemy is moving on my right flank. Like mostly tactical type issues and information that they want mm. to be able to get to start deliberating what's happening. And the answer is, you need to know where you are right now. You need to know your status before you can deal with any of this other stuff. Like, where are you? What's your situation? Like, are you in enemy fire right now? Like, are you in a position to assess what's happening? Where are you? And the light bulb goes off, you know, on, on these young soldiers' heads. They're like, oh, wow. Um, and my point is, is if... A, a, a essential aspect of military operational design and operational approach is knowing your current operational environment. What is your current operational environment, which is a mil military language, really just talking about what, how are you feeling? How's your health? What's, what are your resources? Who's in your community? Who's influencing you? Like, what is your situation? Because that is an, an incredibly important aspect of getting from point A to point B is knowing where point A is, right? Where are you now? Yeah. So you mentioned the term honesty. This is so important, man. And I would argue that in today's social media, hashtag filtered world that we all now live in, it has never been more difficult as it is now for us to be truly honest and authentic with ourselves because most of us feel pressured to display this facade or this image or this projection. It's the, it's the 19th photograph that I took of the same thing that it would just happen to be the perfect one with the perfect lighting, with the perfect filter, with the perfect edit. Like that's what I'm going to post because I want people to see me in this light. And I'm not anti-social media. I, I reckon this is just the, this is just the way things are right now. And that's okay. 
but it does make it more difficult for us to look ourselves in the mirror and go, what is your current status? What, where are you right now? And what do you actually want to do? Not the inspirational hashtag quote you just posted and not what you're telling your teacher or your father or your mother or your friend or your wife or husband. Like, forget all that for a second. What do you actually want to do? Who do you actually want to be? Do you have a high degree of self-awareness and honesty just within yourself? And I would argue that most do not. So I would emphasize early and often the establishment of an internal dialogue. That's, this, is, this is skill. This is a skill. This requires deliberate effort, deliberate work, discipline to go about doing this. Journaling is a huge tool that can be leveraged in order to enable that. But beginning that internal dialogue about what's my current situation, who do I want to become, what do I want to do, doing that while expecting our soul to, to not respond to us right away. I think it's something that takes time. Like any relationship is the one we foster within ourselves. But start that journey. And it's quick. It's easy. I, I don't even want to hear like, oh, I don't have time for that. Like, stop. Like, stop. I'm not hearing any of that. I'm talking a practice that could take you three minutes a day. But dedicate yourself to it. Be deliberate. Begin that process. Increase your level of self-awareness and honesty. Because by doing so, it's going to allow you to gain a full understanding and grasp of your current operational environment, which, again, is critical in order to begin moving from point A to point B. I love that. That's awesome. Because it's like, was it Alice in Wonderland? She's like, which road will take me out of here? And she said, well, where do you want to go? I don't know. Well, he goes, take any road. doesn't matter. There if you, you don't go, know yeah. where you are. Perfect. Yeah. I, I love it. I mean, I can't believe it's 52 minutes. I'm gutted. Like, I know we're short for time, and we would love to do another one. But for those listening... They're they're pumped. They're ready to go. You know they're going to start looking at where they are, etc. They get a copy of the book. How do you want them to use it? How do you want them to take that as their mission? Is it like uh, going to be uh, a drill inspector in their ear, kind of keeping them on mm. track towards their goal? How would you like to see them use the book? I would like the readers to use the book predominantly to recognize their own untapped potential um, and pre-existing potential. There, yes, there will almost certainly be newly acquired knowledge that has been gained, but most of it, man, it's really not revolutionary stuff. It's stuff that most of us are very familiar with. Or we've, we've at least heard about it, that we know what it is, there are times we've done it. There are times we've deliberately ignored it. My goal is for this to be a tool for people to recognize, one, that they have way more inside them to give than what they are giving. And then secondary to that, a byproduct of that are some tips, some tools, some ways of thinking, just some mechanisms to help the reader frame what it is that they're trying to do, and then gives them some resources to leverage day to day, things that actually they can do within real world time and space. I, I love the personal development genre. I read a ton of it. There's some amazing stuff out there. A lot of it remains up in the conceptual level. It's cerebral, right? It's yeah. theoretical, which there's value to that. And I enjoy that. I enjoy reading and consuming that type of content and knowledge. I wanted to take something that addressed that at 30,000 feet but then also rammed it down at the tactical level. Like starting tomorrow, you can do this if you choose to. Starting tomorrow, you can do that if you choose to. Like actual real world things, practices that they can put in place the second that they read it. So that's, that's my overall goal um, of the project is to just use some of my examples and life experiences uh, as, a, as a means to provide some context for just how significant this particular tenant or this particular principle really is. Objective Secure is not an autobiography, man. And that's actually my number one piece of, of what I'll say is negative criticism is that people are expecting to read, you know, the Nick Lavery story 
And that's not what this is. Yes, there are vignettes and, and things I've been through, but it's really just enough to put the reader into my shoes for a very brief moment in time, only to stress the importance of this tool or this thing or this aspect of this character trait. Um, I will just say that we're currently working on a workbook version. This is actually the first time that I'm, I'm actually talking about this out loud, but we're working on a workbook version of Objective awesome. Secure right now that I think will be ready sometime maybe May, June timeframe. And that's just going to take what's inside the book itself. It's going to pass it down. It's going to cut out all the fat. It's going to cut out all the stories. It's going to be much more interactive and user friendly for those that grab it and say, cool, man, like I really want to start implementing some of the stuff in my life. Now the workbook is going to be able to facilitate that. I think with a, with a higher degree of efficiency. Cause I've definitely noticed more people are wanting to you know, like know the story, but like what makes you the man you are? You know, like, because there's not many people who'd be able to lose a leg and come back and be enjoying the special forces again. Not someone who can inspire so many people. Like, your social media is amazing. And it's like you're saying is, there's not many sites, podcasts, etc., where they don't talk up in the clouds. There are very few that actually, sorry, there's very few that actually talk at a level of, here's some concrete action steps. And that's what I like about your book, about your social media. You've got videos on training, diet, just motivational stuff and it's it's how to actually do it i mean i could talk to you about any of these sorts of things for like days and days and days but what would you like them to take from this you know i mean i would love you to come back on at some point but what would if if they had to have a message to go forward from this what would you want them to to use to remember mostly from this yeah and and first off let's definitely do this again um because this this is this has been a great conversation. It actually f- just completely flew by. Um, so let's definitely do this again. But um, awesome, man. There's there's a phrase that comes up every time, uh, oftentimes I should say, and it's this is not a dress rehearsal. And I've said this before on other content and, and podcasts, but I just know it to be true. And Listen, man, I, I've been on all sides of death. I've administered it. I've been next to it when my friend slipped away. And I've been as close to it get to, to as, as close to it gets as a person. This is a gift, man. I mean, life is a gift. And this is sound kumbaya and kittens and rainbows here for a second, which is fine. But just even mathematically, which is an interesting road to go down for a second, the likelihood, Ian, of you being you right now is as close to the definition of a miracle as it really gets. Meaning yeah. something that is essentially impossible without divine intervention. And there's, 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 there's some stats out there to put this in context that if the entire population of San Francisco, around 2.5 million people, all rolled a trillion-sided die at the same time, and they all landed on the same number, that's the likelihood of you being you now. So if we take that as the gift that it really is, and we also recognize that it's something that can end like that, I would argue that we have not only an obligation, uh, but a responsibility to make this gift one of happiness and success. And we've got one shot at this thing. So, and it's going to (laughs) end. Like, spoiler alert, you're going to die. So knowing that it's a gift, we have one chance and it's eventually going to end. Those are basically ironclad truths. So with that, I have one question and that is why not just leave it all out on the field? Why not just go big? I mean, big, like what is the downside? What is really the risk aside from pride, ego, some temporary discomfort I understand all that. I live in the world of risk calculus. But from a 30,000 or 50,000 foot view, it's a gift. It's precious. It can end at any moment. And it will end eventually. Why not go all out now while you have the chance? There are countless and infinite, and now we're getting into the theoretical, people that, that do not exist here now that have the option or opportunity to do what we can. Why not leave it all out on the field? 
I love it. I think that's the, the perfect message. And how can people keep in touch with you, see the evolution of the brand? You know, I mean, you're doing speaking now, you've got the books, you've got the potential, the new workbook, et cetera. What, how can we keep in touch with you, you know, your social media handles, et cetera? But what also do you want this evolution of the brand to be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the short answer, uh, get a hold of me, it's uh, machinenick.com. That's got access to all my socials, uh, direct link to send me email traffic, uh, which I do respond to personally. It can get kind of crazy, but I go in reverse order and I get back to everybody eventually. And there's also ways to get a hold of us for business stuff, speaking, consulting, et cetera. Where do I see the brand going? Man, this is what gets me excited, Ian. I'm going to start sweating here in a second because um, it gets me fired up. I'll tell the, the quick the quick version of the story, this like machine version, man. And that is this this name, this word began as, as me as an individual, right? Like the machine. And that happened as a result of me going back to Afghanistan as a one-legged guy. And within a few months, all the locals were referring to me as the machine. Um, kind of their interpretation of cyborg, right? Like there's this six foot six, 240 pound, one-legged guy walking into their village. It was like, what the hell am I looking at right now? It became as a nickname for me. Um, and that spread throughout the region. And the exact same thing happened the following year when we were in Somalia. So an entirely different continent. And within a few weeks, the same thing happened. Machine, machine, machine. So my teammates just thought it was kind of funny. It began as this person. Well, what it's morphed into now is the idea and the concept and the reality of the team dynamic and really what what that's capable of and how a team when put together with precision is capable of far more than any individual. Uh, the machine, con it's a concept, it's a philosophy. It's the idea of surrounding ourselves with people that push us, people that support us, people that are better than us in a lot of ways. And when that comes together, is when you can create something really special. You create an organism, you create a machine that's capable of, of just about anything. So I look forward to seeing that grow, um, both from a team dynamic, as well as the impact that we're, that we're creating now, but being able to do so at a, at a much greater scale. Um, we, we live in the, in the positive influence space, man. And it's, it's a really amazing uh, place to be. And selfishly, when I get a chance to to spend some time with some people, whether that's one on one or in an arena of a thousand, seeing these light bulbs go off in people's eyes and getting that feedback from them, uh, it's really difficult to put a number or to quantify what that does to me. So. While I'm, I love what I do now in uniform, it's something rooted in both passion and purpose for me. I know what my next purpose in life is, and that's mm -hmm. that's really what I'm doing now. So I'm eager to see um, how it grows. Well, that's it for another week, and thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.